Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. We are back in Ezra, chapter one. Hopefully, we'll finish this chapter uh, today. Kind of uh, review a little bit from last week. It is the year 538 BC. Uh, there's been a switch in empires from the Babylonian Empire to the Persian Empire. Cyrus has come in and he's going to undo a lot of the deportation that the Assyrians had done and the Babylonians had continued. He's going to send people back to their own countries with their gods, with their ch a chance to rebuild their religions. It's his way of kind of putting the peoples back in place. It involves part of his ideal of, of tolerance, but mainly the ideal of him pleasing the gods. There Again, this is not, the, we're in a postmodern age. We came out of the modern age where science and facts were kind of ruling. They were still in a pre-modern age where the source of authority came from the gods, from a higher power. Uh, when that's when you know the Jews believed in that. You know they believed in a God and God's authority established truth and reality. Uh, these people also believed in gods that established truth and reality. And one way of getting ahead was not just to have all the information and all the science, although they would want to have the most advanced weapons and have the most technology, and be able to read and understand history. They also wanted to appease the gods. And in Cyrus's view. Uh, getting all these gods back to their right locations, their, their, their original cities they came from, and having the people go back and uh, worship their gods in this hierarchy of all the deities. He had his chief god up here, but all these other minor gods would be under them. And if they were all happy, they would all be working in harmony. And that is kind of the basis of some of these decrees. So chapter 1, verse 1, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, we referred to this last week, Jeremiah said it was going to be a period of 70 years for the Babylonian Empire, and after that, they would be then overrun. The Lord moved on the heart of Cyrus. That was in fulfillment of Isaiah uh, 45, 48, right in there, where God actually speaks that he's going to raise up Cyrus to bring the people home, to rebuild the temple. He says that in Isaiah. And now the Lord actually does that in fulfillment of his word to Jeremiah, in fulfillment of his word to Isaiah. He moves on the heart of Cyrus. And you're going to see this right here, where God is moving on the hearts uh, of Cyrus here. He's also going to stir the hearts of the people that are going to return, almost giving the impression uh, that those that decide to return are stirred by God to return. Uh, not that people had a bad attitude, they didn't want to return, that God kind of handpicked some that were going to go back. But anyway, right here, Cyrus, he stirs the heart of Cyrus to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it into writing. Uh, again, this proclamation is, as we looked at last week, was going to cover uh, many, many countries, nations that were going to be sent back. And it's going to be probably personal, we're going to be personalized here in the text of Scripture. Uh, but probably would also be personalized for all the different countries. He probably would have gotten advice or input from the relig religious leaders of the different communities. And here it says in the text, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. Now again, this would have been sent out as a proclamation with heralds. It would have been written down. They would have went to the major cities. In this case, the one that we're looking at right now, would have gone to the major Jewish communities, those that had a large Jewish population. The herald would have come in with a decree written out and would have read it with a loud voice shouting this decree to the peoples and they would have heard it, would have gone to the next Jewish community, so they all would have heard this. It's possible that some would have been posted somewhere, some, and we see this in other places, if it's in cuneiform writing, if it's on a stone, it would have been posted somewhere, a monument would have been set up proclaiming this. Uh, later on in chapter 6, they're going to find scrolls with this proclamation on it in the archives uh, uh, that it has been there for 20 years. So we know it's going to be written out in cuneiform writing because we've got the <coughs> cylinder seal of Cyrus that they've discovered. It might have been set around different places, uh, but we also have reference to uh, scrolls being written. So nonetheless, here it is. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. So you can see right here, he probably got this information. Again, it depends on, be careful how you do this. Don't let me overread this and put too much into it. Uh, that's not in the text. Uh, 
But according to what we know about Cyrus, he was not a worshiper of Yahweh the Lord. He had his own God, but he would have been uh, for political expediency to be courteous. He would have used the Jewish term for the God for the and the temple that's going to be built in Jerusalem. He identifies Jerusalem. He identifies a temple. He identifies their God, which would have been in line with his purpose of what he's trying to do. Any one of his people among you, may, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah. That is going to be, we should probably establish that right away. Judah is the name of the province. We have coins from the days of the Persians that have Judah written on them, that have been printed by the Persians for the province of Judah. So when we talk about Israel, uh, we're actually talking about Judah at this time, the people of God, the, uh, the land of Israel. Uh, it was known as Judah or Judea, and it's going to continue on through the years uh, being like it. So when, it, when the people return, all the tribes are going back, but they're going to be known as Judah. They're not going to be known as Israel or the Hebrews. They're going to be known as Judah. And so that's the name of the Persian province that they're being sent back to. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of his Lord, the God of Israel, and the God who is in Jerusalem. Now notice right there, the God who is in Jerusalem. In this hierarchy of gods, you're going to have, you know, the most powerful God. But over here in this little corner of the universe called Jerusalem, the God right there is the Lord. That's Cyrus's way of thinking. And he's going to appease these people, appease this God, and he's going to move over to this God. And this is the location. Here's what he wants. And they're going to, he's going to just fill all this in. In his mind, he's filling in, getting everything organized spiritually as he begins to rule and reign. Now, this is not out of line with God's purpose because God said he was going to do this with Cyrus. Cyrus just, just doesn't understand and have the full picture of what he's involved with. He's got the Lord down here in the corner of one of the provinces where actually the Lord is up here. And if we put in the Jewish mind or in my mind, the biblical mind, the Lord is the Lord over all, all the hosts of heaven. And if you allow this to continue, all the hosts of heaven would include all the sons of God or the angels that God put in position uh, he divided the nations up according to the sons of Israel or the sons of God or the angelic rulers. And we see that popping up in the book of Daniel, the, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece. And it's actually the Lord over all these nations that he's assigned to the ruling powers. And again, that gets into rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And in many times, they're going to be in rebellion towards God and his purpose. Uh, Cyrus is just has that flipped around. It's just like a triangle. You just keep flipping it. It depends on who you've got at the top. And the Lord is at the top uh, in the biblical view. So he continues. Uh, verse 4, And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, and with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of the God of, of Jerusalem. So if he's living in this city, wherever, like, uh, 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 they're living in, in a community, let's just say a, a city, I'm trying to think of a city. Uh, they're living in the, a city right here. Uh, there's going to be some are going to go back, they're going to return. Those that are here, that are going to stay, are going to be providing them with resources. And what is going to be said here, it's gold and silver. I've got that written down here. If you turn to page, I begin breaking this down. Oh my gosh, it's, it's on page four already. I'll have to come back here. Page four, point three on page four. The three types of support for those who return, uh, the first is listed in this verse, is assisted by the men of this place. So if the men of this place in this city, for those that the Lord moves on the heart, in one case, Cyrus is giving a decree because God's moved on his heart, but God's also moving on the hearts of some of the people who are going to return. Cyrus says, if you're of this city, and these people are leaving your city, you're supposed to give them, uh, assisted by the men of this place, with these things. Silver and gold. The second thing is goods, which is a, a word that means in the Hebrew, similar to what ours means. Property, goods, or anything, any movable possessions of, of value. So you know, if they need a microwave, you send them back a microwave. 
and then also beasts, any animals or cattle are to be sent with them. So silver, gold, goods, and we'll just say animals, are to be sent along with these people returning are coming from this city. That's, you, you, that's your responsibility, almost like a taxation, but you're making a choice. But also another thing is added here, free will gifts for the temple. So two of the things that they're being instructed, these people of this city are being told, if you've got people leaving your city to go back, give them gold, silver, goods, and animals, but also a free will offering that is going to be sent, and that will be collected and used to build the temple in Jerusalem. The next thing that's going to come up is going to be, besides these two things, the gold and silver for the people, the free will offering, is going to be the temple treasures uh, that are going to be sent up from the temple that's going to be coming up here next. Uh, then in verse 5 it says, Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, anyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So that's this right here. These, these people right here, they're the ones that are going to return. God's moving on their hearts. Um, all of their neighbors, that's the men of the city, uh, assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock. Articles of silver and gold, just in line with the command, with goods and livestock. And with valuable gifts in addition to the free will offering. So there, there, Cyrus orders this, and so they do this. They give them these things and the free will offering. And then here's the, the, the last thing, verse 7. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. So Nebuchadnezzar had taken these, these articles and brought them. Uh, and this was exactly what the Assyrians had done to the Arameans and other peoples. And I've got a picture here. If you look right here very quickly, on page, I mentioned it last week, but I actually took time this time and got the pictures, page 6 and 7. You remember this from several weeks ago when we were looking at the, had the different timeline up here. Uh, this is the uh, Assyrians destroying the Arameans, going back to the 700s when... Uh, uh, Isaiah warned the king not to uh, call on the Assyrians to come help him, and he paid them to come down and attack the Arameans and attack northern Israel, chapter 7 of Isaiah, and they did. But this is a pictures carved in the temple of uh, uh, the palace of Nineveh in the British Museum now, uh, of the, on those chairs being carried off, or the statues being carried on platforms are the Assyrian soldiers carrying the platforms with the gods. Those are gods being taken out of the temple. Obviously they're not real people sitting on chairs. They're the images of like Baal or uh, 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 Hadad sitting on And you see they've got a place for the, their hands are like this, which would be, be like a bolt of lightning or a scepter or something. And you can still see some things in their hands on some of the statues. And some of them they've been broken off. But they're going to be carried into captivity by the Assyrians. When the Babylon takes over Nineveh, they would have taken possession of these things. And now the Persians have taken over the Babylonians who took over the Assyrians. And now they get in there and here's this treasure house full of all these gods that are out of place. Uh, their people have been taken captive. It's like, well, no wonder the Assyrians and the Babylonians keep failing because they've offended all these gods. So Cyrus, his first step of action, is to take these gods and call the people in, say, let's get your gods here, let's send them back, and you build these temples, get these gods back in the right place so they're not so ticked off at everybody. But when it comes time for the Jew Jewish gods to be found, where, where's the Jewish god? They have no, there's no image that they can take back to Jerusalem, so the best thing they can do is give them the temple. So what is taking place here with the Jews and the, and the treasures being sent back? is no different than what took place with a multitude of other countries of their gods being sent back, financed by uh, the Persians and by the local people to rebuild the city and the temples of these gods. Um, I'm looking on page two at the notes. I do want to point this out on page two. Uh, point one and two, uh, I read that last week. Point one, the Cyrus Cylinder says, Similar, here's what it says on the Cyrus Cylinder. I return to these sacred cities 
the sanctuaries of which had been in ruins for a long time, the images which used to live therein, we've got pictures of it, I just showed you pictures of them doing it, of them there being taken, he's sending them back, and established for them permanent sanctuaries. I also gathered all the former inhabitants and returned them to their habitations. So we just got the Jewish account in the book of Ezra. May all the gods whom I have resettled in their sacred cities ask daily Bel and Nebo for a long life for me. To Marduk, my lord, may they say this, Cyrus, the king who worships you, and Cambyses, his son. So on top of this pyramid would be Marduk, or Marduk, and then underneath there is Bel and Nebo, and in the Jewish case, the Lord. Uh, they're all underneath there. Again, if you just turn that triangle a little bit different, you get a different peak on it. That's what Cyrus had wrote. Uh, point three, the correct religious protocol for all these groups and the gods was important to the Persians. They thought there would be harmony brought about it. Uh, it is likely this document includes diplomatic courtesy to Israel's God, naming him Lord, and may have been written with the advice of some high-ranking Jews. Do remember... Daniel is still alive and active in the Persian government. He, he just translates in 530, in 540, he's working for Belshazzar, really probably not working, he's probably just off the side somewhere. But when the Babylonian Empire falls, he just transitions into the Persians because the king of Babylon, Darius, who Cyrus puts in charge, puts Daniel in a high position over all of the other province leaders and that's where you have the book of Daniel when he gets thrown in the lion's den. So Daniel's going to live down into the first several years of the Persian Empire. So when this decree is written, I, I, I can't tell you Daniel had any input in it, but if you've got a high official helping him make decisions and sending things back and using the proper terminology, Daniel's, we know he's right there in the palace, right in the courtroom, uh, maybe giving advice. It doesn't say that for sure. But when you read the Cyrus Cylinder, and then you read what's written in Ezra, and you realize he's saying things in Ezra that he probably doesn't have the capacity to write and understand himself unless someone's helping him format his writing. And that's, again, not, a, not an insult on Cyrus or on the Scripture or Daniel. That's just everybody working together coming up with a, a document. Because I believe this is a literal document written for the Jews and proclaimed to the Jews uh, as you know, someone probably helped him write it. Um, point five, Josephus records that Cyrus was shown the prophecy of Isaiah 44, 28, which is also highly likely since Jeremiah or Daniel records that in 539, in fact, we go back and look at it in 539, it says he was reading in the prophecy of Jeremiah that the 70 years was fulfilled. He realized it had been 70 years of the Babylonians being in charge, and he began to pray. That's where he begins to confess the sins of the people and pray, and the next thing you see happening is Cyrus coming in and the Jews being sent back. So we know that Daniel was there with the book of Jeremiah, realizing it's time for us to be sent back because Jeremiah said this was the time period. What's also likely that he's got access to Isaiah, or others have access to Isaiah in Babylon, because they took it with them. And it says in Isaiah 44, 28, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. And it's, Josephus says that I, Cyrus was shown this and took action. Now you ask the question, is, did he see this and then write the Cyrus Cylinder in response and he's going to do this for all the nations. Hey, this is a key factor of sending all these things back. Uh, we know the Lord moved his heart. The scripture says it in a couple places. So was it a combination of his own culture, uh, him being shown the verses in Isaiah, the Lord stirring his heart, and of course guys like Daniel being around him. Uh, anyway, that's what takes place. Chapter, uh, page 2, the next verse, chapter 1, verse 3. Whoever is among you of the people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He, who is, he is the God who is in Jerusalem. The next verse, ah, yes. Uh, there's a box right there around a word that is translated in the transliteration there. Uh, and whoever is left, is left. 
is the transliteration or the translation there. Uh, you can see it in the verse, chapter 1, verse 4, and let each survivor, is how the English Standard Version translates it, who is left or is a uh, survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place with silver, gold, with goods, with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. The word survivor here is the word S-H-A-A-R, which is similar to a word that is translated a remnant in Isaiah 10, verse 20. The word remnant is S-H-E-A-R, remnant in Isaiah. Uh, and Isaiah writes this, In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. And those words, one means to remain, to be left over. Uh, the other means uh, to rest, the, re or the rest, the residue, the remnant. I've got that in the square also. And they would have made a direct connection to these words since they're similar. They're talking about a time of the Lord restoring. They would have, when they read that word, when they read that word, they would have made connection with the book of Isaiah. In other words, if Cyrus is writing that, he's using key words like Yahweh. And he's using words like remnant and survivor of the people that have been taken. And they would have been, verses would have been popping up in their minds that this is what has been prophesied already. And they would have recognized it. And then he come up with that. Uh, the ideal of uh, silver and gold being given to them and then they're being financed by the Persian government, it would have also sparked an understanding of the Exodus because that's exactly what happened in the Exodus. We should say the first Exodus. At the first Exodus, they were given money and were sent out into a tough situation in the wilderness to move to the Promised Land. This now, right here, when they read this, not just being stirred up, being the remnant, and having the word the Lord in the decree, they're going to remember or recall that there's going to be a second exodus. And just like they were sent out into the wilderness in a tough situation provided for, they were going to be sent out. Well, here it is. In Isaiah 48, verse 20 through 21, leave Babylon... Now again, this was written 700 B.C. We're in 539 B.C. Leave Babylon, flee from the Babylonians. Now, no, this when we read this, we think of Babylon as that, you know, the, the land of wickedness, if it be the city of Babylon or the city of Rome, or if it be the worldly culture. Paul talks about it, you know, it being leave the world, you know, leave Babylon. Uh, but these people have never been to Babylon when Isaiah writes this. He's not like... Leave, flee from Babylon. We're not in Babylon. We're in Jerusalem. They've already been exported or uh, the exodus out of Egypt. But this is what he's saying. Leave. So this means something completely fresh. And to us, it's got a lot of theological baggage attached to it. Babylon represents the world. Here it says, Leave Babylon. Flee from the Babylonians. Announce this with the shouts of joy and proclamation. Announce makes it sound like Cyrus's proclamation. Announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. And that is exactly what he's doing. He's redeeming Jacob from Babylon. Not from Egypt, but from Babylon. This is way before it happened. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. Referring back to this right here. In the first Exodus when they came out, he made water appear in the wilderness. So you'll be fine. They're going to go back in the second Exodus, going back, and not into the wilderness, but going back to a destroyed city. But remember, the first Exodus, they went into the wilderness and had water. The second Exodus, they'll, he'll also take care of them. Um, we could go to Isaiah 43. I'll just go there very quickly so we get a reference to it. Isaiah 43, um, verses 14 through 28. Um, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians. Again, this is Isaiah writing that he's going to go to Babylon and take the Babylonians as fugitives. 
in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, the, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, the Red Sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses of the Egyptians and the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. Do not think about that, Exodus. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wilderness. He goes on and talks about it, setting the stage for the second Exodus. And so when that decree is read, all those verses that they're familiar with, many of them have been studying them, leaning on them for years, just like we lean on verses, eschatological verses, that we're leaning on, looking for that day, waiting for that moment, someday this is going to happen. All of a sudden, some proclamation is going to be made, some announcement, some development, and all of a sudden it's going to just spin off several verses. You're like, oh my gosh, this is it. And for some of these people, that their hearts were stirred, their hearts are being stirred because they've been waiting for these verses. All of a sudden, here's the proclamation. And just word after word in there is like, oh my gosh, they're buzzwords or keywords or trigger words for this is it. And their hearts, we're going back. It's like, are you sure? I'm absolutely sure. Look at that verse. Look at that verse. This is what Jeremiah talked about. This is what Isaiah talked about. And they're heading back. This is the second exodus. Um, there I listed the three types of support for each return. You're going to be assisted by the men of this place. We talked about that. They're going to have uh, the vessels of the house of God are going to be given to them. But also, not being mentioned here, and we're going to go to Ezra 6, Ezra 6 right now, because 20 years later, this document is going to be found. Uh, they're going to go over there, they're going to run into some trouble, and they're going to stop building. 538, this is going to come to a, a stop. 537, it's going to come to a stop, and nothing's going to be done until 520. And they're going to start taking some action. Why are we not getting this done? The prophets, Agai and uh, Zechariah are going to show up. And they're going to say, you can't build this. And they're going to, the Samaritans are going to send a letter back. We're talking in 520. They're going to send a letter back to the Persians. Now by this time, Cyrus and Cambyses, Cyrus and his son Cambyses are gone. And Darius is ruling. And he's rebuilding the country from the, from the chaos that ensued in the revolt that took place after Cambyses' death. And Cambyses' focus was Egypt. He put all of his focus on moving down into Egypt, marched across the desert, kept pursuing Egypt, he ended up having to turn back, and a huge army just perished in the wilderness in the desert itself. But there's a time here of confusion. Darius is rebuilding it. And in 520 right here, the Jews want to rebuild their temple. They're being told by Zechariah and Haggai, get this done. And the Samaritans are going to come and send a letter over to Darius and tell him, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is a bad idea. This is a rebellious people. Why do you think they've never been allowed to build their temple before? And uh, then someone's going to follow up and say, well, we have a decree from, from Cyrus. Cyrus decreed it. And that's in chapter 6. Now go to chapter 6. Um, King Darius then issued an order, chapter 6, verse 1. This is in 520, almost 20 years later. They searched in the archives stored in the treasury at Babylon. So the Samaritans send a letter over saying, don't let them build. The Jews say, wait a minute. They send their own lawyers over and say, we've got a decree that says we can rebuild it. Darius says, well, I don't know anything about this. I'm busy ruling the Persian government. I don't know anything about Judah. He says, I make a decree that someone go look in there. I sign the paper, go check the archives. Verse 2, a scroll was found in the citadel of Ecbatana. Notice this. They searched the treasury at Babylon. Didn't find anything. A scroll was found in the citadel of Ecbatana. You can see this. There's Babylon. There's Ecbatana. Do you know one of the last places we see Daniel living was Ecbatana. He had a palace in Ecbatana. That's where he was a high rule, ruling official in Ecbatana. It, it's possible that they found his library or his archive, uh, citadel of Ecbatana, in the province of Media. Now notice right there, study. It's, it's over somewhere in Media. And this was written on it. Memor memorandum in the first year of King Cyrus now we're talking in 520 recounting what we just read in the first year of King Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem now this is a document recounting what Cyrus says so it's not the exact document 
but it's a document about giving credence to the document or the proclamation. So notice what is said here. What you're going to see in here that you didn't see before was that uh, point B. A, you're going to see assisted by the men of, this play, of his place. You're going to see the vessels of the house of God. But you're also going to see something when they go in there and start digging in it. Not only, not only are you, one, going to be getting gifts from the people, and three, uh, gifts for the temple uh, from the government, this is from, you know, from the people. There's something else that's going to be here that's going to be included, which is like, who saw this coming? Uh, this was the Persian Empire. This was the frontier over here. And so this area, part of the Persian Empire on the Trans-Euphrates River, on the other side of the Trans-Euphrates River, was also part of the Persian government. And so once you take control of this government, you control all the resources. And so by 520, they've got full control over here, and uh, they're going to give them, well, here it is. I'll just read it. This is whoever wrote this decree or this memorandum is quoting from the decree issued by Cyrus. And he says, Let the temple be rebuilt as a place to present, present sacrifices and let its foundations be laid. It is the it is to be 90 feet high and 90 feet wide with three courses of large stones and one of timbers. The costs are to be paid by the royal treasury. So there's your building permit on how big your building can be. The costs are going to come from the Persian royal treasury. Also the gold and silver articles of the house of God which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple of Jerusalem and brought to Babylon are to be returned to their place in the temple in Jerusalem. They are to be deposited in the house of God. So we saw this taking place right here, but now we've added the royal treasury. In other words, they go over there, the, 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 uh, the Samaritans are going to say, they're not, they shouldn't build this to Darius because they're a rebellious people. The lawyers of the Jews go over and say, there's a decree somewhere in the archive that says we can do it. They can't find it in Babylon, they find it in Nectana, and when they find it, it not only says you can build it, it also says, oh, the Persians are going to finance it. So all of a sudden, the Samaritans find themselves completely defeated in court. And here's verse 6. We'll get to this later. Now then, Tatania, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Sheth Bozina, and you, their fellow officials of that province, stay away from there. Do not interfere with the work of the temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild the house of God. So in other words, all you guys that are coming against the governors that are over here on the trans-Euphrates that they're causing them trouble, cease. But also, moreover, I hereby decree what you are to do for these elders of the Jews in the construction of the house of God. The expenses of these men are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury from the revenues of trans-Euphrates. Do you understand what's taking place? Over here, the governors, the Samaritans, were getting people on board to prevent the Jews from building the temple. They find in the archives of Ecbectana, 20 years later, a decree, not only mentioning the gifts of the people and the gifts for the temple, but also the Persians are supposed to pay for it. And if the Persians are going to pay for it, according to Cyrus's decree, it would be best if it comes right from this territory. So the very governors who are trying to prevent it, they're now being told, you need to finance it from your own treasury. All the taxation you're being sent, sending over to us, we need you to send part of that down to Jerusalem. The expenses of these men are to be fully paid out of the royal treasuries from the revenues of Trans-Euphrates so that the work will not stop whatever is needed. Young bulls, rams, male lambs, and burnt offerings to the Lord, the God of heaven, and the wheat, salt, wine, oil as required by the priests of Jerusalem must be given them daily without fail so that they may offer sacrifices pleasing to the God of heaven and pray for the well-being of the king and his sons. So in other words, God... They had opposition, and by the time God gets it turned around, they're actually having to come down and finance even the sacrifices in the, uh, in the temple. Verse 11, furthermore, I decree that if anyone changes this eating, now watch, if someone says, oh, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to change this decree, we're going to make some adjustments in the decree given out at this time. If anyone from Cyrus's day, if anyone came against this, and changes this edict. It says a beam is to be pulled from his house, and he is to be lifted up and impaled on it. And for 
reason I went there was for you to see that there's supposed to be gifts from the local people given to their own people returning. The gifts are coming from the government to help finance the temple. But here it says the royal treasury is supposed to build for the whole thing, not just gifts for the temple, but the, the entire building process. And a little more details are given there. So now, with that being said, verse 5, uh, in the English Standard Version, bottom page 4, Then rose up the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and Levites, and everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. So there's certain individuals rose up. We're going to get a list of that in chapter 2. All those that come back are going to be listed in chapter 2. But those that hear this, I would assume again that those that have been faithful to Scripture to the Word of God, they've been waiting for these verses, they've been studying, maybe trying to anticipate, figure out eschatologically, when do we go back? When are the promises going to be restored? They may have been this time chart and this little diagram and this representation is going to happen here. Well, it can't happen until this man is in office. I think these things will happen first, then this will take place. All their little diagrams, eschatological charts, Daniel probably had his. And then one day, Daniel reads and realizes it's 70 years from the time of Nebuchadnezzar or the time of the Babylonians. It's time right here. And he started praying, and a bunch of things kicked into action. Then here comes the decree, and those people have been studying. Maybe they had maybe they had this eschatological diagram, or maybe they were disagreeing and they had this one. But when they hear this proclamation that is read in 539, they realize, oh my gosh, we are right here. It's not this. It's not this. It's us. And those hearts were stirred. I would say it was probably those, if they weren't paying attention to Scripture, they're going to hear that proclamation and be like, who cares? Who's, who's going back to Jerusalem? But if they've been waiting to go back to Jerusalem and they've been waiting this time reading Scripture, they're going to hear that. And I've got to think, it's not just an emotional stirring of the heart where they're just like, you know, singing songs and all giddy. It's like, oh, let's go on an adventure. I've been wanting to go somewhere. Uh, they've been waiting following so it's going to be the spirit of God it's going to be the word of God and it's going to be their own attitude and own will that's going to stir them back which leads us to the point of why we study scripture is so that when God begins to move and act you're ready to recognize it and say oh well God moved my heart well yeah because your heart was in line with scripture and you knew what was going on you were looking for these events if you're not looking for the Lord's return you're not interested in the Lord's return you're interested in the next event on earth but anyway Everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Verse 6. And all who were about them, all who were about them, that means all who were living around them, aided them with vessels of silver and with gold. In other words, they gave them gold and silver. They didn't necessarily give them bars of gold and bars of silver, but they gave them vessels of gold and silver. Uh, with goods, that would be your, you know, your microwaves and your, you know, whatever, uh, things that you can use, with beasts and with costly wares besides all that was freely offered. Um, in the point one there, the, the Jews fulfilled Cyrus's order by providing the gold and silver, but also Cyrus was following God's desire. So the Lord, the Lord moves on Cyrus, Cyrus makes a decree, and the people who are not returning give money and finances to the people who were going back to Jerusalem. So you can see the chain of effect. Lord Cyrus and the people of their own community are going back. They're all moved to go. Cyrus probably had some kind of input there because it's a decree. You better get support of your people, almost like a, a taxation in a sense. Um, verse 7. Cyrus the king also brought out vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. We've already talked about that. He's going to be there's not just there's not just golden vessels from Jerusalem there. There's things from all the countries that have been conquered. I'm going to push it by the Assyrians, anything the Babylonians had taken. And I would assume some of the things you see here on those pictures of the Aramean gods were part of that treasure house. And some of these gods were put back and taken out and sent back to the Arameans. Uh, and I write that down. Since there's no images or gods or statues that came from the Jewish temple, the only thing they've got there would be the vessels, the articles that they used for worship. And I write those things down there in some details and some pictures. Verse 8, Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out 
in the charge of Mithridath. See if I can write down the board here. It's not necessarily important. Mithridath, except for the sake of having it written on the board. Mithridath, who is the treasurer. And that is a Persian word for treasurer. So what's interesting here is this Mithridath is a Persian name that honors the sun god Mithras. Uh, the name means Mithras has given. So this is a Persian name. Now we're getting into some names right here. Getting ready to look at uh, uh, Bel uh, uh, Zerubbabel and uh, uh, Sh Shazbazer. Uh, and one thing about these is there, there's, we know this from Daniel. Daniel has a Jewish name, he has a personal name, but he's also going to have a Belshazzar. That was his court name. This was his Babylonian name. Uh, Daniel was, he didn't, never, he never stopped using the name Daniel, but he's known as Belshazzar. Uh, this is interesting just because we just got done having all of our sons back together for the first time in five years. And Paul and Stacy, they're home from New Zealand. and. Zach's home after five years of Taiwan, and then of course Ben and Miku, they're back in the States, they've been in Hawaii, and Nathan goes back and forth with Purdue, or Purdue, uh, Brazil, <coughs> with his wife, and uh, then they all get together for the first time, and then you just, as a dad, you just sit there and just listen, you know, just listen to, uh, because obviously they're surviving without me, and they no longer need my advice, they need mom's advice. Um, but one of, just one of the things that they talk about was, uh, different pronunciations and different languages because you know they're in Brazil they're speaking Portuguese and Taiwan Zach learned Mandarin and speaking you know Chinese pretty good he even taught a class in Chinese one day um, you know as he develops his language but uh, nonetheless the point for saying that is they have names uh, oh oh he was saying, I mean, I'm trying to think where I want to start the story. His name is Zachary James Wieners. But they write the names different. They write the last name first, then they write, you know, the, their, their first name or their middle name last or whatever. So whenever they would see his name, they would see Zachary. And because in, in, the, in Taiwan, according to what I understood, I am not an expert, but things like the Z A C H Zach sound, then the R, and then the Re Zachary, or it's hard for them to say. Now, just I know this from being a teacher in school. And I had 580 students last year, and you take attendance, or that first day you go through, and make sure all your kids are in class, and it's just a you know, if they're John and Bob and Cindy, uh, I can get by. But then all of a sudden. You got someone that spells, you know, with their name with a silent Z or something, and you're trying to pronounce it, whatever. Or they're, they got a foreign name, and you just stumble through. You just like, and especially in our sensitive culture today, you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm going to end up in the office. I'm going I'm to try to take attendance here. I'm going to pronounce his name, and you know, you're going to make someone mad. And you know, I so I, start, I just start making fun of everybody's name. I just I mispronounce everything. It's Benjamin. I'll say Benjamin, and they go, it's Benjamin. Just to, just to make fun of every, just I just just sink everybody, and by that time it's a joke. You're not picking on anybody because you know I can't even say the American names. But anyway, he says that they would see Zachary James Weemers, and, and if you go somewhere like to the, the eye doctor or something, and they look at the name, they'd go James, because they can't say Zachary. They stumble over Zachary like I'd stumble over a variety of names. They can say James because James is a popular name when when they take an English name. They've got their Taiwanese name or their Chinese name or their Japanese name. They'll also have a English name just to make life. I remember we went to Jerusalem and our group was a, a Chinese girl from China. Uh, now you wonder if she was a spy. But uh, and her name was, she had a name and she told us her name. And we all kind of like, oh, she goes, just call me Nancy. So we called her Nancy. That wasn't her name. Uh, and the same thing, if I'd go over there, my name's Galen Weemers, they would be like possibly stumbling all over it. And they said, just call me, what do you want to call me? And then they give me a name. Nonetheless, that's what this is about. He talked about people that you'd have in class that a lot of times when they come into the class, they, would, they wouldn't use their Chinese name 
or they're Taiwanese, there's international kids from different countries there, that they just give him an English name and they'd have it like this right here. So in Daniel's order, they, they may have, again, they may have been for religious reasons, may have been for political reasons, it may have just been for pronunciation and cultural reasons. Your name is what? Yeah, we'll call you Belshazzar. You know, your name is what? And, and so what we're getting into right here now is some names and uh, the difference in names sometimes can be a big deal, religious thing, we're gonna rename you or you've got your court name or it may just be like in Zach's case, it just may be easier to pronounce and easier to communicate. Um, but here we have this uh, Mithridath was the treasure and both this word treasure in the Hebrew text is not a Hebrew word it's a it's a Persian word for and it means treasurer and this is clearly a Persian name so you've got apparently a Persian now again we can't be absolutely sure because if you if you ran into a guy in the court named Belshazzar you say ah surely this guy is a Babylonian because Belshazzar is a Babylonian name but no 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 I'm Jewish I've just got a a Babylonian name. So this Mithridath has a Persian name and he's called a treasure with a Persian word. Which means we're now looking at Persian documents. Meaning this guy was a treasure, not in the Hebrew culture, he was a treasure in the Persian courtroom. So he, because it's, it's, it's the Persian name for the treasurer. Which leads us now to the next page here very quickly. Uh, the word treasure is gizbar in a Persian word. This word is identified as a foreign word in the Hebrew concordance, which means treasure. Then we come to Shaz, Shazbazer. Shazbazer. And this is where we have, again, it says right here, he is called a prince, and he's called a prince of Judah. Now, I don't know how far I'm going to get on this, get through this tonight. Uh, the word prince of Judah, right away, your first your first way, and again, this is not wrong or right, but your first way of going, prince of Judah, he's royalty. Judah is the tribe of Judah, the line of David. Prince, obviously, if you prince is son of a king, he's of royal descent. The thing about it, again, that's it. Shazbazer is in the royal line, in the royal line of David, because he's prince of Judah. Yeah, you can see it right here. I'm reading in... Uh, uh, in, in verse 8, Cyrus the king of Persia had them brought to Mithridath, the treasurer who counted them out to Shazbazer, the prince of Judah. So you've got a Persian official with a Persian title going into this room. Again, you've got to imagine, it's not just got the Jewish treasures in there. It's got treasures from temple after treasure, after from temple after temple. I think it's got to be like what's going into uh, the treasury of the Vatican. I mean, what is buried in there? It's just treasure after treasure of different, who knows what's in there? Or, what, you know, where's, I could go on and give you an example. Think of national treasure. Uh, but then uh, he takes it out, who counted them out to Shazbazer, the prince of Judah. So Shazbazer is an official from uh, representing the Jewish people. And he's, he, the Mithridath has a list. This, these are the things that go to you. Here's the inventory. It may have been a list, an, an archive uh, created by Nebuchadnezzar's men when they plundered Jerusalem. And here it is. We're reading this off to you. These are the things that belong, and they go back to this temple in Jerusalem. So now, Prince of Jude, the first thing about this is right here. Point A, under 3 on page 8. Uh, Prince is the word Nasi, N-A-S-I-Y. It means one lifted up. It means a chief. It means a prince. The word is not only used to refer to royalty, but also to leaders of many types and levels. So this word prince does not, it can be used in royalty, but it can simply mean the leader. It can mean the chief. It can mean the one. Now, now where does this come from? Does it come because they're a prince declared by God of the royal line of David? Or does it mean they're the chief or they're in charge because they're appointed by Cyrus? or they're appointed by some other government official, they're the leader of something. Now remember what I said about Judah. When you see Judah, you go right back to the tribe of Judah, the tribe of the king. But Judah is the province. 
when Persia is sending these people back, they're sending them back, they're not sending them back to Israel, they're not sending them to Palestine, they're sending them back to the province called Judah. So this could mean Prince of Judah in the royalty of the line of the Messiah. Or this could mean someone appointed as the leader of the province, the Persian province of Judah. He's now the one that's the governor of the province of Judah. Appointed, this is appointed by God himself. This is appointed by some government official. I mean, we don't know. That's just, that's just what the words can mean. Uh, so I've got that written right down there, the details of that. It could be an important local leader of the Jews. The prince of Judah would make him a leader in the royal tribe. Or Ezekiel 34, 24, Ezekiel uses the same term prince, N-A-S-I-I, Nasi, to refer to the Davidic Messiah. So in Ezekiel 34, 24, written in Babylon, written in a very similar time frame in the last 50 years, Ezekiel uses this term prince to refer to the Messiah who's coming from the line of David. So there is room to call this the royal line. Just saying. But it's not a guarantee. You can't build your case on that. Uh, Shaz Bazar is a Babylonian name. So this name right here is Babylonian. Ah, so he's not Jewish. Well, right, but neither was Daniel. This is a Babylonian name. He could be Jewish, Prince of Judah. He could be from the royal line of David. And they just gave him a Babylonian name, just like Daniel is from the royal line. He was one of the royal children, and given a Babylonian. We're no different. This would be the same. This would be like a cousin of Daniel, as far as we know. But it is a Babylonian name, and it means Shamash, the sun god, protects the sun, not the sun, but the child. Or Sin, the moon god, protects the father. Depends on how you translate it. And Daniel's name, Belshazzar, also had a Babylonian name. You hear the name, the god Bel. Bell in there. So he was named after the guy. How'd you like to be Daniel, faithful to Yahweh and the temple and the law, and go to Babylon and be named after Bell? You know, it'd be like me becoming a Muslim, being named Muhammad, calling Muhammad. It's like, what? My name's Muhammad? Okay. You know, now that my name switched to Peter or Paul or somebody, but, you know, but it, they're, they're in charge, that's what you're called. Uh, Shez Bazar is only mentioned by name in this verse right here. Now, where we're heading right here is to discuss, I'm going to get this started, we'll have to finish this next week, uh, at least follow up on it, is we're going to, uh, Shez Bazar, is how does he relate to Zerubbabel? If I spell those wrong, I apologize, I should be better. This Shez Bazar is only mentioned by name in two places. One right here, when Cyrus entrusts him with the temple treasures and with the rebuilding of the temple. The other time he appears is in Ezra chapter 5. And we're going to go there and read that right now. In Ezra chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, when they're talking about um, uh, the temple being built 18 years later and the, and the, and the details of here. Um, Ezra chapter 5, going back to that same, oh, go to chapter 5, verse 1. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet. See, now we're talking, Zerubbabel's going to be mentioned right here in 539 in Ezra chapter 1. Now he's going to be mentioned in 520 in Ezra chapter 5. Are you ready for this? So here he's being given the temple treasures in Persia, you know, from Babylon, and being said that he's going to be the leader. In 520, it appears now they're going to be referring back to these events, right, some historical background, and they're going to be talking about him. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Did you catch that? That's why you're all are looking, right? Shezbazer is mentioned in Ezra chapter 1 in 539. And then Ezra chapter 5 in 520. In this case right here, I'm going to read it to you. It sounds like they're talking about an historical figure that some 20 years before was given the temple treasures and sent over to Jerusalem and he was in charge. 
So here it is right here. I'm in chapter 5, verse 14. Uh, they're, they're talking about... Well, here, let me just read chapter 5, verse 1. Now Haggai the prophet, Zechariah the prophet, the descendant of Idu, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. Right here. That's, that's these guys right here. Haggai, Zechariah, 520. Darius is king. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shatiel, and Jeshua, son of Jazadek, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. So that's, the, that's what they're talking about right here in 520. At that time, Tatino, governor of the trans Euphrates, and this other guy, they asked him, Who authorized you to rebuild this temple and restore the structure? That's where we get to chapter 6, where they go over and find the decree. So they start rebuilding in 520. A lawsuit breaks out, and that's already referred to that. They send someone over there to say, these guys shouldn't be building. They send a delegation that says, check the archives. They check the archives, find it next to and they say, now you've got to finance it. It says you're supposed to finance it. But what we're looking at right here during this time is in verse 14. Uh, verse, verse 11, this is the answer they gave us. We are the servants of God of heaven and earth. Uh, verse 12, but because our fathers angered the God of heaven, he handed them over to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 13, however, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. Now here we go. They're, they're talking, and this is now talking in 520, about the year 539, and you're going to see Shiz, Shizbazer's name pop up again. The only two times it's going to pop up. He even removed from, that te moved from the temple of Babylon the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to the temple in Babylon. Then King Cyrus gave them to the temple items to a man named Shezbazer. That's what we just read in chapter 1. They're recounting that in 520, saying this is what happened 20 years ago. Whom he had appointed governor. Cyrus back here, had appointed Shizbazer as governor. Now there's your idea right there. Governor would be the ideal of prince. Now he might be the prince in the line of David, or he may just be the leader of the province of Judah. But he was appointed the governor of the province of Judah by Cyrus. And he says, take these articles and go and deposit them in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, interesting, they can't deposit in the temple of Jerusalem until the temple is done, and the temple's not going to be done until 520, so where have they sat for 20 years? And rebuild the house of God on its site. So this Shazbazer came and laid the foundations of the house of God in Jerusalem. From that day to the present, it has been under construction, but it is not yet finished. So for 20 years, this house is being built, but it hasn't been done. The problem is right there, those are the only times you hear the name Shezbazer. Is when he gets the articles from Mithridath and is sent by Cyrus back. And now they just, all they're doing here, all they're doing, it's not like he's mentioned twice. He's mentioned once. It's just referred to in a historical fact. Now the question is going to be, is he Zerubbabel? Because Zerubbabel is going to become eventually the governor and he's going to build the temple. And... The question is going to be, are these the same people? Uh, is this the Persian name, the court name of this man here? And this is his Jewish name. Uh, Zerubbabel is going to clearly be in the line of Jehoiachin. Uh, he's going to be his grandson. So he is the grandson of the king that was taken captive. Uh, we can see that. He's going to come back. He's got direct lineage. He's, he is definitely a prince of Judah in the royal line, and he is the governor of the province of Judah appointed by the Persians. So he's the prince of Judah in a sense, by God, and the prince of Judah by the governor. And that's the rubble. Now I've got written out here some details. We'll get into it next week some more, uh, how these guys can be the same or can be different. I will tell you this in conclusion. Um, page 9, the summary points, and again, I'm interested in this because I'm interested in it. But in summary, Shez, there's two ideas of thinking. Uh, Shez Bazar uh, is a foreign official given the title of governor of the province of Judah or the prince of Judah, but is not Jewish and is not in the line of David. 
So this guy right here is just like Mesredith was a official for the Persians, Mesredith gives Shezbazer the articles because he's now appointed by Cyrus as the governor overseeing this development of Judah, but it's not Zerubbabel. The other idea is Shezbazer is the official court name of Zerubbabel, but Zerubbabel's lineage to the line of David is only given in the Jewish setting when his own name is used. So whenever it's like this is Daniel and this is Beltesh Belteshazzar. In other words, when you're talking about the, the Babylonian or the Persian name, you never dare mention the line of David. So, but when he mentions Zerubbabel in the Jewish setting, you throw in there, he's a descendant of the King Jehoiachin. So there are the same. So they're either two different people or they are the same people. Um, one commentary I was reading claims that all modern scholars are unanimous that Shezbazer was not the same person as Zerubbabel. That these are two different people. Um, I, I'm I'm torn between the two. I mean, uh, the idea that in 520 they're writing in 520 about Cyrus sending this guy Shezbazer back, and yet Zerubbabel is standing right there finishing the temple, being prophesied. Hey, yeah, or Zechariah, they're prophesying to Zerubbabel. They're saying to Zerubbabel in prophecy in 520 while he's standing there. But yeah, they're talking about Shezbazer in the past tense, which leads me to think they're two different people. Um, but you've got precedence that this could be the same person because both Zerubbabel and Shezbazer are going to show up in chapter 2 uh, when, you, when we get into chapter 2 next week, if we ever get to chapter 2 next week. Um, look in chapter 2, uh, verse 1. Now these are the people from the provinces who came up from the captivity, whom Nebuchadnezzar goes through, talked about that. Verse 2. In company with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, and these guys, and gives you a list. So by chapter chapter 1, Shezbazer is being given the temple items and being s sent back to Babylon, or Jerusalem. In chapter 2, verse 2, by the time they get back there, Zerubbabel is now there. And he's going to be the governor working with the high priest for the next 20 years. So, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. We'll try and clean it up a little bit next week. Um, there's an answer there somewhere. But it's nice to know what the details are. I, get, I got many things to say about that. We'll talk about it next week. I'll pray and it will be done. Father, we do thank you for the chance to look into these things. We ask that we may handle them correctly, that we may find encouragement from the scripture. So when things begin to happen in our life, if it be personal, if it be national, if it be historical, eschatological, that we'll be stirred by your spirit leading us and guiding us in your direction because our hearts are in tune with your word and with your will. Father, we do again thank you for this chance to look into your word and ask that you continue to lead and guide each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.